Welcome to the Sports Time Traveler. This is Len Furman with a new episode that I'm very excited about. It's titled Records and Reckoning. The NFL Games of 12163 featured legacy making battles and new standards in key stats. We start with an introduction from the Sports Time Traveler. I'm pleased to be continuing my coverage of the 1963 NFL season. I've been following the key games from each weekend precisely 60 years ago, going back to late October. We're now in week 12 of the 14-week season. The games are becoming critically important as only the two division winners will play in the postseason for the NFL championship. Everyone else goes home. Legacies can't be created if you don't play for the title. If you've missed any of the prior five weeks in my coverage, you can find them on the written version of the Substack article. And if you look at that version on Substack, you'll see uh, in, right in this spot in the introduction, you'll see hyperlinks to each of those first five articles that go back to the games of October 27, 1963. Now also a special note regarding the Kennedy assassination. As I read the newspapers in my time travels back to 1963, I couldn't help but look at the coverage of the Kennedy assassination, which took place on 11 63 In looking at the newspapers around this week's games, I made an astonishing discovery of things I had never heard before related to the assassination. I've included these findings at the end of this article after the football coverage below. Now, Let's go back to the games played on Sunday of uh, December 1st, 1963. Records and Reckoning. New York, December 2nd, 1963. I'm reporting to you from New York City on Monday, December 2nd, 1963, regarding the NFL games played yesterday. Let's start with Vikings versus Bears at Wrigley Field. The Western Division leading Chicago Bears with a 9-1-1 record hosted the Minnesota Vikings with a 4-7 record. The Vikings are in a three-way tie for fourth place and out of playoff contention. The Bears beat the Vikings handily in Minnesota 28-7 back in week two. But now things are different. We're getting to crunch time. The Bears hold a slim half-game lead on the two-time defending NFL champion Packers who are 9-2-1. The Packers tied the Lions on Thanksgiving Day. For the Bears, who have not won the division since 1956, this week's game is a reckoning. It's a grand opportunity to take clear command of the division. After the Bears beat the Packers for the second time this season, two weeks ago, 26-7, it was looking like the Bears might just cruise to the division title. Then the Bears went to Pittsburgh where they could only manage a 17-all tie in the strange environment that pervaded across the NFL when all teams were ordered by the league to play their scheduled games just 48 hours after President Kennedy had been killed. Now back home, the Bears need to reestablish their ground against this much weaker opponent. Now you can see the highlights from this game. Again, if you go to the written version on Substack, I found a two-minute YouTube video of key highlights from the game. Now let's hear about those highlights. So at the start of the video, there's an intriguing aerial view of Wrigley Field as it is set up for football. I had never seen this before. After the teams traded field goals in the first quarter, the Vikings engineered an impressive second-quarter drive led by backup quarterback Ron Vanderkellen, a rookie, who hasn't played in two months. Vanderkellen is playing for the injured Fran Tarkenton. In the first play on the highlights tape, Vanderkellen hits Gordy Smith on a perfectly executed play-action pass for 30 yards to get down to the Bears' two. A moment later, the Vikings score and take a surprising 10-3 lead. Later in the second quarter, at the 50-second mark on the tape, watch as Vanderkellen deftly avoids a sack on his own 38. He then throws on the run to Gordy Smith again. Smith catches the ball to Bears 40 and sprints all the way to the end zone. The Vikings now have a 14-point lead on the team with the NFL's best record. It's Vikings 17, 
Bears 3 at halftime. It's only the second time this season the Bears have been down by 14 or more points in a game. The only other time was in their inexplicable loss to the league's worst team, the 49ers, back in San Francisco on October 20th. When the, in that game, the 49ers raced out to a 17 to nothing halftime lead, and the stunned Bears could not come back, losing the game 20 to 14 for their only loss of the season. In this game, in the third quarter, the Bears came out playing hard. Watch as Bears running back Willie Gallimore bowls his way to the Vikings five, leading to a touchdown that claws the Bears back into the game. You can see that at about the one minute mark on the tape. But still, Chicago trailed 17 to nothing entering the fourth quarter. Midway through the final period, the Bears caught a big break. Watch at the 141 mark on the tape as Vikings running back Tommy Mason fumbles at his own 31-yard line. Then watch on the tape at 204, the 204 mark on the tape, as the Bears quarterback Billy Wade connects with Joe Marconi in the end zone for a touchdown that ties the game. And that's how it remained. Final score, Vikings 17, Bears 17. The Bears have now played to a 17-all tie in two consecutive games. Had they won, the Bears would have been one and a half games up on the Packers with just two to play. With the tie, they still retain sole possession of first place, but their lead over the Packers, the two-time defending champions, is just a half a game with two games remaining. The Bears, however, do have the tiebreaker over the Packers if it comes to that, as they beat the Packers in both of their meetings this year. Now, let's move south to Dallas, where the Giants were visiting the Cowboys at the Cotton Bowl. This was the first game to be played in Dallas since the assassination took place here nine days earlier. The Giants entered the game in a three-way tie for first place in the Eastern Division with the Cleveland Browns and the St. Louis Cardinals. A victory over the 3-8 and eight Cowboys is necessary for the Giants to have a strong chance of claiming the Eastern title. The Giants have won the title in four of the past five years, but they've lost the NFL championship game each time. To get back to the title game, it is vital that they beat Dallas in this one. And Dallas is a team that New York easily defeated 37-21 to back on October 20th. Now, I also have a very short video highlights from this game in the Substack article that start at the 1726 mark on the video. Things started out perfectly in this game for the Giants. Watch at the 1730 mark on the video for one of the most remarkable plays you will ever see. Cowboys quarterback Don Meredith drops back to pass. He throws a screen pass from his own five-yard line. The ball is batted high up into the air by Giants linebacker Jerry Hillebrand. The ball, flying several feet over Hillebrand's head, is on a short flight trajectory towards the end zone, where Hillebrand follows it and reels it in for a pick six. It's the first touchdown of Hillebrand's career, and it gives the Giants the early 7-0 lead. But after capturing the early lead, the Giants' offense sputtered. Y.A. Tittle, the Giants' quarterback, was intercepted three times, and the Giants' defense couldn't stop the running of the Cowboys, who gained 126 yards rushing in the first half. The Cowboys scored two TDs in the first quarter, two more in the second quarter, and took an impressive 13-point halftime lead. Cowboys 27, Giants 13 at halftime. The Giants' defense regrouped after halftime. Hillebrand intercepted Meredith again, giving the Giants the ball at the Dallas 5. But this time, the Giants failed to score after the interception. Still down 14 points, the Giants got the ball again, and this time, Tittle led them on a 74-yard drive that ended with him running one yard for the touchdown. The Giants had pulled to within six points at 27-21, after three quarters. Early in the fourth quarter, the Giants cut the lead to three on a Don Chandler 11-yard field goal. 
That made it 27-24. Then with five minutes to go in the game and facing fourth down at midfield, the Giants brought in Chandler again. He was kicking from his own 47-yard line. Watch at the 1743 mark on the tape as Don Chandler ties the game with a 53-yard field goal with just five minutes remaining. The 53-yard field goal by Chandler set a New York Giants record, and it's the third longest in NFL history up to this time. It ties Chandler with Sam Baker of Dallas for the longest field goal up to this point in the 1960s. The only longer field goals in NFL history at this time are a 54-yarder by Glenn Presnell of Detroit back in 1934 and the 56-yarder by Burt Rechichar of Baltimore in 1953 that represents the current NFL record. Chandler boasted in the locker room to the New York Times reporter, I could have kicked a field goal for 60 yards today. The wind was that strong. My kick was good by at least 10 yards. Now, with the game tied, the Giants' defense gave them another opportunity. The Giants' Jim Catcavage sacked Cowboys quarterback Don Meredith. In the New York Times, William Wallace wrote, Catcavage hit Don Meredith so hard at the end that he fumbled, and John Lovatier recovered the ball with two minutes left to play. Y.A. Tittle then hit Del Schaffner on a 17-yard pass to win the game 34-27. The Giants had outscored Dallas 21 to nothing in the second half to go home as winners. Gene Ward wrote in the New York Daily News, It was a shaky victory, to say the least. But when the chips were down, Y.A. Tittle and Del Schaffner got the job done. A career record for Y.A. Tittle. The final touchdown pass by Tittle also set a monumental record. It was the 197th career touchdown pass by the Bald Eagle. Good for a new all-time career NFL record. Ward wrote that, quote, Tittle didn't see the completion of his record-busting pass. He was flat on his back at the time. Y.A. Tittle's record solidifies his stature as one of the greatest athletes ever to wear a uniform in the city of New York. Just the day before, on Saturday, December 1, 1963, the New York Daily News had published a piece lionizing the bald eagle. Harry Cronin wrote these words in the Daily News. Technically, Y.A. Tittle was a great quarterback long before he came to the New York Giants, but it wasn't until Tittle came to New York that he took on the luminous aura with which Big Town has surrounded a Babe Ruth, a Jack Dempsey, a Joe DiMaggio, or a Willie Mays. Now, with Tittle pulling out the victory over Dallas in the final two minutes, he adds further to that legend. All that is left for Y.A. Tittle is to deliver an NFL championship to New York. Now let's head back north, halfway up the country again, to see the Cleveland Browns versus the St. Louis Cardinals in St. Louis. Two of the three teams tied for the Eastern Division lead met at Bush Stadium as the Browns visited the Cardinals. The Cardinals were fresh off a 24-17 upset of the Giants the prior week. But of course, the magnitude of that victory, which was the Cardinals' third in a row and put them in a three-way tie for first, was tempered by the fact that it came on the day when most of the crowd and players were still numb in the hours after President Kennedy had been killed. Now the Cardinals were at home, facing the formidable Browns and running back Jim Brown to see if they really had a shot at the Eastern title. The Cards have not won the division since 1948 when they were based in Chicago. The Browns, on the other hand, have every reason to believe they can win the Eastern division. They have perhaps the best player in football, possibly the greatest of all time, in Jim Brown. And Jim Brown is having a whale of a season. Coming into the game on Sunday, he was just 29 yards shy of the single-season rushing record that he set in 1958 
of 1,527 yards in a 12-game season. The Browns had also won their opening six games of the season, all by double digits, before falling into a mid-season swoon when they were belted by the Giants on October 27th by a score of 33-6. to The Browns also lost to these same Cardinals in an upset victory, upset loss in Cleveland just two weeks ago when Cardinals quarterback Charlie Johnson had an unexpectedly brilliant game, passing 25 for 34 for 285 yards and two TDs. But after a win last week, the Browns are ready to reclaim first or at least maintain themselves in a tie and give themselves a chance at a championship game berth against either the Packers or the Bears, the only two teams in the Western Division with a chance. The Browns got the first advantage in the game, but on the opening series, the Cardinals fumbled, leading to a Cleveland 23-yard TD pass by Frank Ryan. Ryan was back a quarterback, having lost his job in the middle of the swoon. Ryan apparently has his confidence back, and he also knew who to give the ball to on offense. On the Browns' second drive, Late in the first quarter, Ryan handed off to Jim Brown, who scorched the Cardinals for a 61-yard run. The 61-yard run by Brown was a fitting way for him to obliterate his own single-season rushing record. Even though Brown now has the benefit of a 14-game season, he broke the record in here in just game 12, and he did it with seven less carries than he did in 1958 when he had 257 carries to 250 at the end of yesterday's game. Unfortunately, the Browns couldn't take advantage of Jim Brown's run as the Cardinals intercepted Frank Ryan to end the scoring threat. But on the next two drives, the Browns could not be stopped. Ryan connected on a 49-yard pass that set up a Jim Brown TD run, and then Ryan led a 73-yard 12-play drive that included a 33-yard pass and ended the same way, with Jim Brown crossing the goal line. Jim Brown rushed for two TDs in the second quarter to give Cleveland a large halftime lead of 21-3. The Browns played ball control in the second half, trading touchdowns with the Cardinals as they went on to win the game 24-10. One of the keys to the game was the Browns' defense shutting down Cardinals quarterback Charlie Johnson, who only managed nine completes in 26 attempts for just 58 yards. It was Johnson's worst game of the season. Jim Brown led the way for Cleveland, rushing for 179 yards on 29 carries to increase his new single-season rushing record to 1,677 yards in just 12 games. Note from the sports time traveler. Back here in the present time, I have to admit that I found it quite incredible that Jim Brown's record gathered no headlines in any major newspaper in the United States. And sadly, there is no video of Brown's 61-yard dash in the first quarter. That run is what set the new single-season record. But to get an idea of how amazing a runner Jim Brown was back in 1963. Watch the highlights video I have in the written version of the Substack article and watch it at the 126 mark of the tape. What you're going to see is actually a pass reception from a game of the Browns against the Redskins on September 15th, 1963, so about two and a half months earlier. But that that highlight right there shows off how impossible it was to stop Jim Brown, who literally ran over runners and broke tackles. He just could not be stopped. In that particular highlight, he runs about 80 yards for a touchdown after a short pass. Now back to 1963. There are two games left in the 1963 season. Only the the division winners will go to the postseason NFL championship game. Here's the standings after the games of December 1st. Eastern Division. First place tie, New York Giants and Cleveland Browns, both nine and three. Second place, St. Louis Cardinals, eight and four. Fourth place, Pittsburgh Steelers, six, three and three. Did I say St. Louis was second? St. Louis is in third place. Pittsburgh, fourth place at six, three and three. 
technically the, the Pittsburgh Steelers still have a chance. The Dallas Cowboys, fifth place, three and nine. Washington Redskins, sixth place, three and nine. Philadelphia Eagles, last seventh and last place, two, eight and two. In the Western Division, it's just a two-team race now. The Chicago Bears in first at nine, one and two. The Green Bay Packers in second at nine, two and one. Further back in third place, the Baltimore Colts, six and six. Fourth place, the Los Angeles Rams, five and seven. And then a fifth place tie between the Detroit Lions and the Minnesota Vikings, both four, seven and one. Then the Los Angeles Rams, I'm sorry, the, um, then the San Francisco 49ers in last place at two and 10. And we finish with an update on the Kennedy assassination. As I followed the games of December 1, 1963, I came across some astonishing findings related to the Kennedy assassination that I have never heard before. In a special to the New York Times, on December 2, 1963, a story appeared about Lee Harvey Oswald's mother, Marguerite Oswald. Mrs. Oswald, who was a nurse, had some pointed questions for which she insisted the public needs to know the answers. She asked, why was not this man a defector under complete surveillance? Speaking about her son, Lee Harvey Oswald, who had defected to the Soviet Union and returned to the United States. And secondly, she asked, why would a known underworld character, she's referring to Jack Ruby, be allowed within a few feet of a prisoner, of any prisoner? These are excellent questions in light of the fact that Oswald was a well-known defector and Ruby was, a well, was well known as having mafia ties. In my sports time travels early, I came across an earlier article last year about Lee Harvey Oswald that appeared in newspapers across America in June 1962, over a year before the assassination. Oswald at that time had come back from living in the Soviet Union, and the AP story started out with this sentence. A former United States Marine who defected to the Soviet Union is on his way home. Lee Harvey Oswald, 24, of Fort Worth, Texas, is taking his Russian wife and infant child along with him. Marguerite Oswald was correct in assessing that federal officials should have been tracking the whereabouts of Lee Harvey Oswald given the 15 minutes of national fame he already had garnered in 1962. Marguerite seemed bitter in the article as she suggested that if the federal agencies had done their job in keeping tabs on her son, he wouldn't have had the chance to kill Kennedy or be involved in some way. And Marguerite wasn't the only one suggesting that Jack Ruby's access to kill her son was highly suspicious. Dorothy Kilgallen, the nationally syndicated columnist and panelist on the hit TV show What's My Line?, used her daily Voice of Broadway newspaper column to weigh in on the Kennedy assassination. On November 29, 1963, in her nationally syndicated column, Dorothy Kilgallen wrote this. If Lee Harvey Oswald was President Kennedy's assassin, he was the most important prisoner the police of this country had in custody in 100 years and no blithe announcement in Dallas is going to satisfy the American public that the case is closed. I'd like to know how, in a big, smart town like Dallas, a man like Jack Ruby, operator of a striptease honky-tonk, could stroll in and out of police headquarters as if it were a health club at a time when a small army of law enforcers were keeping a tight security guard on Oswald. That was the quote from Dorothy Kilgallen. Now, coming back to Marguerite Oswald, she had one more interesting thing to share with the New York Times in the December 2nd, 1963 article. The article contained this passage about Mrs. Oswald. Quote, she insisted that on the night of November 23rd, about 17 hours before Ruby shot her son, an agent from the FBI showed her Jack Ruby's photograph. Mrs. Oswald, Oswald contended that the episode, as she described it, indicated that authorities had advanced knowledge that Ruby might attempt to kill Oswald. The article then went on to include this, quote, the FBI would officially make no comment on Mrs. Oswald's charge. It was understood, however, 
that federal agencies had acknowledged that she had been shown a photograph that night for identification, but spokesmen would not disclose whether it was that of Ruby. End quote. Now, I am not purporting to try and solve the mystery of the Kennedy assassination, which has been a subject of great inquiry for 60 years. But as a curious consumer of the assassination conspiracy theories, I can tell you that I've never come across this statement by Marguerite Oswald before, and it really makes me wonder. Final note from the Sports Time Traveler. Thanks for reading this edition of the Sports Time Traveler. Coming soon will be the games from week 13 of the 1963 NFL season. With just two weeks to go, it's a dogfight for the top spots in the Eastern and Western divisions. The winners will play for the 1963 NFL Championship game on December 29th. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye now.